all of us who are gathered here know of Sri Aurobindo, have perhaps read something of his writings and known a little of his life and some perhaps a lot. But what I propose to do in this and the subsequent two sessions is to offer a kind of an introduction to Sri Aurobindo. Given the limitation of time, it will necessarily be not entire, but it will be a perspective, I hope, that will allow us to better appreciate his life and his work in the first session now, his writings and his thought which will be in the second session and in the third session the unique characteristics and insights that he brings in his teachings which stand out in human history and perhaps will stand as guidelines for the further human evolution. And so I will assume we know nothing of his background. In looking back at Sri Aurobindo's place in human history, in time it will become obvious that he will be seen as one of the foremost who literally defines an age. Always such people tend to be so far ahead of their time because they are defining the new age that during their time they are not always recognized or known popularly. But the popular knowing has, as you know, very little value. It's very easy to promote somebody in the media and make them an overnight celebrity. But precisely you can hit a popular mass because of shallowness. If you aim to project something of depth, you cannot hit the masses. That's the reality we have to face. And so, in time this will be obvious. Just as, and I will make an analogy here of Sri Aurobindo with another who we know as defining an age is Leonardo da Vinci, who in his time was known as a genius, as a great artist, as an extraordinary discoverer and explorer of knowledge. But when you look back a hundred or two hundred years later, you realize that it was not just the work he did, which was of course prolific and multi-sided, but literally he represents the mind that Europe had to grow into through that whole period of what is called the Enlightenment, Age of Enlightenment. But he becomes as if the prototype of the mind which then extends and infuses into the collective consciousness. When you look back at his work, he has done everything from engineering through to optics, through sciences, through the arts and uh, perspective drawings, uh, calculations on various kinds of, and creation of various kinds of machines, literally everything which became popular later in the age that follows, you will find already in his drawings and in his writings. But during his period, okay, great artist perhaps, and that's about it. And it's the same with Sri Aurobindo. And so with this background, when we look back at Sri Aurobindo, we will see not only that, well, he was a great poet, he called himself, he was very humble, so he just said, I'm a poet and a politician. But we see also an extraordinary philosopher who raises the field of philosophy to heights and depths and widths, which today we will say, well, just break the boundaries of all the schools of philosophy in the past, and even going back to the depth of the Upanishadic texts of the philosophy, lifts them out and takes them to st still new heights and depths. And he is, of course, brilliant as a writer. His poetry is so outstanding, some of which we will look at tomorrow uh, in the next session. But he raises the English language, the way Shakespeare lifted it to a new level. And then we hardly know him, though, as a scientist, as a psychologist, as an administrator, and of course as a yogi. And this aspect of the yogi is perhaps the most important for us, and perhaps the least easy to document, because it is entirely of an inner domain. Even with looking back at Leonardo, if not the papers 
if the papers had not survived, we would not know his aspects of science and such. And it is the same with Sri Aurobindo. When you look back at the mass of his writings, as well as later the letters that he wrote to disciples as a way of helping them in their spiritual progress, the mass is so great, an enormous quantity, perhaps we may say up to one third or even half did not survive for reasons that perhaps we may see later, but many of them just destroyed because people did not store them properly or someone that I know personally stored them in his cupboard and he had more than a thousand letters and he was ill for a while and when he opened the cupboards, uh, it was all eaten up by the termites. And so much has been lost, including some extraordinary translations. But he says, Sri Aurobindo himself writes, if all that I had written had survived, I would have had the dubious distinction of being one of the most prolific writers in human history. It's a dubious distinction because it's not what, how much you write, but the content itself, which we will look at in the next. So this as a quick background before we enter into his life, and I will uh, not go too much into the historical details which are irrelevant for this understanding because of lack of time also, but in prioritizing the yogic aspect. Uh, so, but we may just touch upon some as we go along. He was born in 1872, August 15th, early morning. You can cast his horoscope and it's one of the most extraordinary horoscopes you will ever find in history. Uh, there are aspects to it, if you know your astrology well enough, which are just outstanding. That year is also amazing for another reason. It was the, in human history, the year in which the solar flares which were so strong that you could see the aurora borealis all the way to the equator. It was the most intense light show in history, uh, recorded history at least. It's always when an exceptional being is born, well, nature itself, so to say, is impacted by that, the force of that. Well, uh, at the age of about five, he was sent by his father, who was an Anglophile, to go to England and study in the best of um, education he could get. And he did not want him to become Indian. He wanted him to become a true British, because he saw that as, as the superior uh, position. Sri Aurobindo was sent at that young age, no contact with his parents. He was put in a place, there was not enough money because his father would send money, it would not always reach, and there was not enough always even to eat. So he lived for so many years through his education, and the bulk of it being in what is today the Cambridge University, where he excelled in every field that he touched. And to this day we have the record of his colleagues, who each became exceptional administrators in the British government, subsequently, because they were all studying for the ICS, Indian Civil Service, and other administrative positions. Each of them became ex exceptional in their position, and each looks back and says later in life, we always knew that he would be an exceptional being, exceptional man, would achieve exceptional things wherever he went, which we do see even in his school years. We find, for example, that he's studying Greek and Latin, among other things, and he's studying Greek in the ancient Greek, not the modern Greek, and himself writing poetry in ancient Greek with rhyme and rhythm. Now that shows you an exceptional capacity while still a teenager with languages. And we find later in his life that over the years he had mastered not only the English language, but he had mastered French, he knew Russian, he had a little bit of, I believe, a I'm not sure, but Spanish perhaps, and um, Arabic. And when he comes to India, after completing his studies in Cambridge, he knows nothing of Indian culture and nothing of Indian languages. And he learns on his own, masters Bengali, which was his mother tongue, masters Sanskrit, Gujarati, where he was uh, with the Maharaja of Baroda as secretary, ruling an entire uh, state, and which is like a country, we will see later learns Tamil, of course Hindi, Marathi, because he's in a domain where there is Marathi spoken. Each of these he masters. He's fluent in writing and can write poetry in most of these languages. That shows you real mastery, okay? And so one has to wonder at what is this extraordinary genius? What is he capable of? And 
we will see in the next session, every field that he touches, he breaks the boundaries of that field and defines new standards, which yet humanity has to catch up with. Now this is the part of the work, the period in England, where while studying, he comes across a translation of the Upanishads. And he's exposed to the idea, the concept of the self and the Brahman. And at that point, he has, as a result of an effort, an experience of that silence of the Brahman. He says, in the mind, in the mental consciousness, he had this experience. He's also realizing that uh, this is not the direction he wants to go. Briefly, he is part of a society that's speaking of liberating India from colonization. And at the end of this, when he comes out with flying colors, he is excelled in every uh, one of the exams that he had to pass. The last exam was the horse riding test. And he chooses to not attend the horse riding test and therefore is technically disqualified after having the highest marks. And he chooses that because he did not want to enter British service. Had he been that, he would have been, as you will see later, he would have ruled India, literally. But he chooses not to do that. He goes back to India, comes on the Indian soil after so many years, and the first experience is a tremendous descent of peace. He then enters the service of the Maharaja of Baroda. Now, we have to understand what India is like and what this Maharaja of Baroda represents to understand Sri Aurobindo's role there as the chief secretary of the state of the Maharaja of Baroda itself. So, India, as you know, is as big in terms of land mass, as big as the whole of Europe. It's about one third the land mass of the United States. But in terms of population, it is far bigger than the United States and Europe put together. As you know, it is now the most populous country. But at that time already, it was one of the most populous countries. A single state in India is equivalent in size and population to a country in Europe. And so Maharaja of Baroda represents actually the equivalent of what would be today the prime minister or president of an entire country in Europe. And Sri Aurobindo is his right-hand man and the secretary of the state. He defines the state policies, he defines the governance structures, handles the whole development of the state. Now you have to understand what that means. Literally, if you say uh, somebody who is now in charge of the whole development of France, and in a period of 10 years leads it from uh, poverty to exceptional uh, wealth and growth. And unfortunately, all of this is not described in most of the biographies of Sri Aurobindo. Uh, what he achieves there, under Maharaja of Baroda, working with him. Uh, they build a new navy, they bring in the railway and integrate the whole state. Uh, they begin a whole program of industrialization. And Sri Aurobindo writes the whole framework of industrialization program. They start a new university and uh, revamp the whole educational framework. And all this is being done by Sri Aurobindo. Of course, the credit goes to Maharaja of Baroda. And Maharaja of Baroda has speeches all of which were written by Sri Aurobindo, in the bulk at least, in which these um, strategies are described. When you look back at Sri Aurobindo's strategy for industrialization or revamping education, you say, wow, this man is thinking what we need today. And the strategies are applicable today if you just take them en masse with a little bit of change of vocabulary. Because now certain things, you see in those days he speaks of exhibitions to train people, to make people aware. Now today it would be media, instead of exhibitions. But with those slight changes of vocabulary, you see the strategy he had for the rebuilding of an entire country. And you must understand, Baroda state is a country, equivalent, as I said, to Europe. But then later, Sri Aurobindo extends this to the whole of India. At some point, while he's doing this, uh, there are very interesting incidents, stories, uh, when Maharaja Baroda proudly, he used to go for a walk, and he comes back from a walk and says proudly that, oh, I saw this woman, she had this load on her head which had fallen and I helped to put it back on her. You see, I'm so humble, I'm so great. That was the imp implied story of the Maharaja. And Sri Aurobindo laughs. And Maharaja knows how great this man is, so he says, why are you laughing? What did I do wrong? Sri Aurobindo says, the responsibility, Maharaja means king, the responsibility of a king is not to put the burden back on the people, it's to take it off from their head. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> what an insight. And of course, the man goes back immediately, asks for that woman to be brought and gives her whatever was needed to make her independent. 
So little stories like this, full of insights. Unfortunately, we don't have time to go into those. But do read. Do read Sri Aurobindo's uh, Time in Baroda State, which is in a little booklet, uh, which I don't know if we have here. But uh, now he moves from there to the larger program of liberating India from colonization. At that time, he had to leave the Maharaja because he did not want to endanger the work that was being done. He goes from there and begins what will become the largest revolutionary movement organized for overthrowing a colonial state. And it has no equivalent anywhere else on earth. He organizes single-handed. He travels all over India, meets these people, organizes their programs to make the people independent and break away the dependence on the colonization rule. It's a strategy which is economic as well as political and informational, educational, to wake people up. He begins writing articles and these articles are so incisive, so revealing, that people now begin to read because it helps them to understand. Now, you can write political articles, you can write inspirational articles and shake people up. Come on, wake up, let's fight. People will say, yeah, yeah, good for you to speak, but it doesn't touch me. But when you have an insight that makes you think, oh, I didn't think of it like this, you, it changes you. And whether you like it or not, now you live differently. That's the nature of the articles that he wrote. All of these are available. They are like two volumes of a thousand pages, each part of his collected works, in which he goes into the political situations of that age, of that period, but always going back to first principles. This is the characteristic of all his writings. Because he goes to first principles, you read those articles today, and you say, ah, yes, this is very useful in this situation in the world today. And they all have relevance. Again, you have to change a few words. So there's the partition of Bengal and he's writing about that. And then later, 50 years later, you understand the partition of India and it applies to that. And then you see the partition of Cyprus and you see the partition of other countries which the British left and you see it applies to that. And then you find today in other countries or in Europe, you see, or in the United States, almost as if a tendency for two groups to want to divide the country to well serve their different values. And that article still applies to them, it applies to us now. And this is just one example that I give. Again, it would take a couple of hours to go into some of the other insights which he brings into the field of politics and administration and governance and economy and industrialization all of which are there in those articles. Uh, we have a lot to read, I think, <laughs> just to catch up. And so uh, that period is one of a radical awakening. And he has not picked up a gun once. He has not made a bomb. He doesn't need to. Because what he's doing now is shaking the foundations of the British Empire. Because you must understand, the British Empire was run on finances from India. The sun never sets on the British Empire, they said, because it encompassed the globe, but the funding for that came from India. And the moment the British lost India, the empire collapsed. Again, it's a long story of how they were taxing and converting India's wealth and destroying industries step by step in order to export the industry to the uh, UK and then make India a raw material supplier. And from India producing 25% of the global industrial output in 1825, let's say to India producing less than 1% when the British left India. It's a story of decline and collapse economically and industrially, and Sri Aurobindo is trying to reverse that. At a time when India has just passed through 50 years of artificially induced for means to bring the country down to its knees, where every 10th person, that is 10% of the population has died of hunger because of the particular uh, strategies used by the British to weaken and make the civilization collapse. If every tenth person dies in a joint family, what happens to the rest of the family? They're on the brink of death, literally. And that's how India was brought to its knees and a new system of education introduced, which was designed, as Lord Macaulay said, to turn India, India into a nation of clerks. Sri Aurobindo steps in at that point, enters the political field and begins the reversal of this. You must understand the mindset of the people. They are thinking, no hope. British are the only great rulers and we have to become better servants. The Congress party is begun by a Britisher to organize this subservience 
to England. And Sri Aurobindo enters the political field and there's this great meeting that takes place in Surat where he breaks away. He, remember, he has already become very well known in India. He's a leader. People look up to him for leadership. He breaks away and forms his own tent and people start going to his tent and not to the other Congress leaders. And he engineered the split of the Congress into what was called the radical or the extremists because they demanded full freedom. The others said, no, we want to be better servants. And he says, no, we want full freedom. But then he defines why India needs to be free. And that is also very interesting. It's not because we hate the British. It's not because you're bad rulers. It's because he says, India has a role to fulfill in the future of humanity without which humanity would not be able to survive. It's a spiritual role. In order to fulfill that role, India must find her soul first. Well, she has lost it. Okay, there's a period of decline of 2,000 years almost. And in order to find her soul, India needs to be free. And here's the foundation of our spiritual life also. You really want to find your soul, you need to be free. Free to discover yourself, and it includes the freedom to make mistakes, isn't it? <laughs> so that's the goal, that's the purpose of his organization of the freedom movement. And there's a report that goes from the Viceroy of India to the King of England, where he writes, and this is on record, Aurobindo Ghosh is the most dangerous man in India today. And what is he doing? He's writing articles. He's giving public speeches. That's about it. What makes him the most dangerous? Fascinating. And then, of course, there's a period where he also begins the whole new movement of education. He accepts to become the principal of the new college in which the new system of education is being formed for India when it will become free. Because now you have to liberate the mind of the people. It's not enough to have political freedom. You see the mess India is in still. Although you see a change happening in the last 10 years, it's still it's a remnant of that whole continuity of the colonized mentality. You have to break free of that. And as, as I keep saying, you have political freedom, but you still have to have cultural freedom, intellectual freedom, freedom of thought to be able to find your own way to run your own country. And then there is the spiritual freedom which has to follow. And economic freedom is part of that. So uh, all this is he's looking ahead and planning for an initiating action on those levels. Much of his action is still not been implemented. The framework of education that he formed, which would very closely aligned with what is today known as the Montessori system or the what came from uh, Rudolf Steiner, the Waldorf school. Very close similarities, but he's writing, he's paralleling them even in age, in time. Sri Aurobindo writes on education, for example, 1907 and 8, and that's around the time Maria Montessori is writing her writings. She completes, and her best works are in 1943, when she's living for 12 years in Chennai next to Sri Aurobindo, like 100, 100 miles away. Knows of Sri Aurobindo, has read his writings, and writes a letter dedicating her book to Sri Aurobindo. And this letter still exists. To show you how deeply that influence came into Maria Montessori's thought. But that is known, the Montessori system is known. Sri Aurobindo's education is not even known in India. And this is an enormous failure of the... Indian government and the Indian people. And of course, it's, it applies for the world. My point is he is so far ahead of his time that it's still, we're still catching up to put into practice what he brought. So this is to give you a quick sense of his work in that period. Uh, the revolutionary work led to a stage when the momentum of the freedom movement had taken over. Now it was inevitable. It was only a question of time. And by that time, Sri Aurobindo has had his first entry formally into the spiritual life. How it began was he was at his uncle's place. His uncle is sick. And a sadhu, we say, like a wandering monk, comes to at their gate and asks for food. It was the, the pattern for those who were ascetics to not even own food and they would ask for food and be satisfied with whatever came or if nothing came. So someone comes to the door and when he hears that there's someone sick in the house, he asks for a glass of water, chants a mantra, makes a cross with a knife over it and says, give this water. The uncle drinks the water and his fever is gone instantly. Sri Aurobindo says, hey, this is interesting. Can we um, bring this power to help for India's freedom? 
Remember, he is one pointedly thinking of this. And for this purpose, he begins his own practice of pranayama, breathing exercises, concentration practices, whatever he could at that point, whatever he knew. Remember, he is already studying. Going back to the period when he was with the Maharaja of Baroda, there would be a crate of books that would come every week. And by the end of the week, he had read most of it and the next crate of books would come. Now this is something quite extraordinary and we are told that uh, one of the examples uh, given was that someone asked him, what have you read? If you read so fast, what do you retain? And he asked the person to open on any page and he tells you pretty much what's on that page. So you see an extraordinary capacity to absorb knowledge, but also at that point he is growing in knowledge, but also um, I missed the point which I wanted to connect. But um, during that period, he is absorbing all this knowledge and he continues while in the freedom struggle, during the freedom struggle, to write his articles. And a stage comes when he is taken into the yoga. He is writing his poetry. This is, yeah, this is where it connects. Uh, he is writing his poetry as he begins the practices of pranayama. And sometimes he said it went up to six hours or even ten hours. The power of intuition developed so intensely that where he would write some four lines of good poetry, and you have to see his standard of what is good poetry, um, he had 200 lines flowing through. And something shifted at that point. He has entered into a formal practice of some kind. His consciousness has begun to expand in ways. And at some point he meets a yogi by the name of Lele who tells him, uh, you know what, what you should do is sit down and concentrate and watch your thoughts coming in and refuse to have the thoughts come in. So Sri Aurobindo said, I had never heard that you could actually see your thoughts or prevent them. So he sits down and does his thing, follows to the T the advice. In three days he had reached a state of complete silence of mind, entered into the poise which we would call the nirvanic experience in the Buddhist tradition and he's living in this nirvana. It lasted for several months. And he said it seemed as if it was so complete, it seemed as if this is it. But then something deeper within felt no weight. Uh, and he, there was a guidance already which had emerged and he waited and then a, a new movement of descent began to fill this emptiness. And thus began the perception of the fullness of Brahman as opposed to the negation of Brahman. And he speaks of this uh, two sides of the Brahman experience. And all this is happening in the midst of his fight for freedom. So this is to show you that the spiritual life was not cut off from the worldly life. It became the foundation for an extraordinary material action of organization of an entire freedom movement. As I said, the largest ever organized in human history. And it's very important to recognize this because Sri Aurobindo's yoga is not an ascetic yoga of withdrawal from the world. It is a yoga for transforming life and to manifest the divine in life. And he's an example of this. People remember the period, which we will come to later, where he withdrew from public uh, contact for a specific reason, but that's not the example. This is the example of what we have to be. And yet a situation comes where he receives an inner guidance that he should now withdraw. But he says, how can I let go? Who will run this whole movement? Because he's the one point, single pointed focal point for this whole organization. And if he suddenly vanishes, the whole thing might collapse, isn't it? So he's a, he refuses to let go, but the inner guidance is clear. At that point, the British uh, foist a fake case against him and put him in jail in solitary imprisonment. Sri Aurobindo is deeply pained. He goes through intense struggle. Solitary confinement is not what he has been prepared for or is used to. He even feels as if he might, uh, the rush of thoughts and emotions is uncontrollable. And at that point he receives again the inner guidance from the divine, from Sri Krishna as he describes it, who says, you remember a month back I had asked you to withdraw and you couldn't. So I have broken your attachment to your work. And I have brought you here for a greater work. And we have to understand this liberation of India from uh, colonization was a small step. Remember the goal was the gift of spirituality to the world and it is towards this now that he is being prepared. And Sri Krishna reveals to him at that point the entire program of practice of the yoga. It's a seven step 
seven fold with four steps in each of the seven stages and which we will discuss tomorrow perhaps in the third session in greater detail and he puts this into practice in jail and it's a very difficult time if you read his uh, reminiscences which is called tales of prison life under uh, the british uh, authority he was given one plate in which to defecate in which to eat and drink that's the standard of luxury he said that he had to live in and at some point a couple of uh, weeks down he is given the luxury of stepping out of his solitary confinement room and walking and he describes there uh, some of the experiences as he walks he dwells on the mantras of the isha of the upanishads and begins to perceive the divine presence everywhere and in all things and he feels that presence embracing him and the springs of love flow from his heart which was he says which was hardened and rajasic and her whole nature undergoes a change but this is remember during a period of intense practice of the sadhana in a very clear framework and structure it's not an arbitrary um, practice of trying out things or just a devotional movement there is a framework to it and in the midst of that he enters certain states in which he experiences this so completely this poetry streaming through and if you remember the in- poem which is called invitation he describes he invites you to join him in his journey where he is uh, not bound in the little cell but in the freedom of the mountain and that's the symbolic of the journey of life and the spiritual journey and there is an incident where the jailer who was the guard outside his door sees him floating in the air he is in this intense state where the entire body loses weight and literally is as if floating off it, seems sri arbindo says it was not entirely floating but it was leaning on one side he's sitting cross legged and one side is on the floor and the rest of the body is as if floating so the jailer was very moved and be- began to treat him differently subsequently so a year after sri arbindo was released he continues his writing and organizing of the freedom movement but something has changed and he writes to his brother that where there was so much activity now there is only silence and he says this is not enough the foundation has to be deeper even for the freedom movement but he is now being led by the inner guidance and the guidance says we are very clearly now go to pondicherry and he leaves by the next ship he is led he arrives in pondicherry there are people there who greet him and then the next 5 years is a period period of intense sadhana tapasya you know the word tapasya is tapas means intense heat of concentration and his whole period of the practice is entering a degree which is uh, amazing had it been only this much we would never have known what happened fortunately for us he was maintaining daily diary notes these are uh, written under a book under under the title of record of yoga for 5 years and then it continued a little more later and gradually became less and less but literally day to day he is describing the progress the breakthrough the changes the occasional relapses the integration of different parts of the sadhana remember it's a multifaceted sadhana seven stages and four steps in each of the stages so that makes for um, 28 things at the same time as if unfolding if you had to make an analogy of a flower then you have as if um, four layers of seven petals each layer opening up and while the sadhana is going on including there are aspects of the framework which involve the spiritual consciousness going all the way to the most material consciousness to transform the body itself and the body itself is undergoing a change now again we go back to the time when he was in jail his colleagues notice that his hair is shiny as if oiled and in jail they give you nothing so they asked him how is it uh, your hair is shining uh, did you apply oil did they give you special benefits he says no and he explains because of the sadhana my body is undergoing certain changes by the action of the spiritual force and the body is releasing the oils which are making the hair shiny at a cellular level he says there are changes taking place and this if if it was the early stage of his sadhana imagine what happens in those 5 years So we are not looking back at what happens to the freedom struggle he has left it in the hands of others he was given the assurance it's no more his responsibility he is entirely here now in the record of yoga we find all these descriptions 
of changes taking place even in his body, of states of consciousness that he is entering, he is mastering, and the ability to impact the world from those states of consciousness. So sometimes very simple things. He describes how he sees a bird flying and he is able to change the direction of the bird's flight by willing it. He is observing from the window somebody walking by and he is able to change the person's behavior and make him do things. So he describes how the first time when the person was moving, um, he puts a will for the person to go and roll up a mat and put it in place and the person hesitates, looks at the mat and then goes on and he puts this fresh wave of will and this time the man does it. And he says this is typically the response of a uh, tamasic nature, a person of inertia. So he needs to put a kind of a double force to make him do. And then he's seeing things which are prophetic uh, with precision. So when will the tea come? And he sees the image of the clock and the exact time and exactly at that time the tea is brought. Things of detail involving people's inner states of thought and emotion, ability to intervene in their states, ability to shift their state of consciousness, lift them, ability to infuse a spiritual experience into a person, all of this is described and documented in great detail, sometimes cryptically, but in great detail. And then we have people who had those experiences with him, and then we get a sense of how it worked with them. Now, 1914 becomes, is a very important year because the mother came and met him. And when the mother saw him, she recognized him as the one who had been guiding her from her childhood. And so we take a brief uh, detour on this. Unfortunately, we cannot go too much into the mother's life, but just enough to link it to Sri Aurobindo's work. From her childhood, she felt the divine presence above the head, and she knew that there was a great work to be done. And at, that, at, at a certain stage, even as a child, she would find herself going out of the body, rising above the city, and she would see in the subtle body beings coming, touching her, and then going back with the peace infused in them. And in that state, there would be many teachers who would come and give her deeper knowledge. One who came very frequently was the person that she recognized as Sri Aurobindo. So when she saw him, she knew that her work was with him. And there's a very interesting description of Sri Aurobindo describing that uh, contact, where he says that when he saw her at that point, in her consciousness, the recognition of Sri Aurobindo made her surrender entirely to him. And as soon, she writes, as soon as I saw Sri Aurobindo, I recognized in him the well-known being whom I used to call Krishna. I was seated close to him, simply like that on the floor. Suddenly I felt within me as if a great force, peace, silence, massive. And then she says, I didn't have any thoughts left. The effort she had made for years to attain to this perfect silence, Sri Aurobindo just gave it in one sitting. And that was it. She says, it never left her. Sri Aurobindo observes in that first meeting, he says, I had never seen anywhere a self-surrender so absolute and unreserved. And of course it was destined, they were supposed to work together. And unfortunately with the beginning of the world war, she was required to go leave India and so she goes to Japan and then eventually returns in 1920 at the end of the war. Now this start of the war is also very interesting because uh, the Paul Richard, who was married to the mother at that time, proposed to Sri Aurobindo. He saw in him a great uh, philosopher, so he said, we need to start a journal together. Sri Aurobindo says, okay, why not? He says, because it was my attitude as a yogi to accept whatever came my way. So he's, they start a journal and it's called the Arya. Now this is extremely important. Sri Aurobindo starts writing the journal and the First World War begins. So here's this enormous clash of forces as if the very darkness is, wants to seize upon humanity and destroy any possibility of civilizational growth and evolution. And Sri Aurobindo is literally at that point the lighthouse through whom this extraordinary knowledge is pouring through in the Arya. 64 pages every month that he's typing. Because Paul Richard left shortly, the entire journal was his to, to write. And we have the record from people who were with him, they said, he would say, remind me a couple of days before uh, when I have to submit the writings to the press. 
Now you would imagine that he would be spending every month. That means he would be spending all his time through the rest of the month writing for the next issue. No, he's not. He just says, remind me when it's time to send it to the press. So someone reminds him, he sits at the typewriter and types out an entire chapter of one book, which becomes later one book. But that's not it. He's writing six books at a time. So chapter one of the first book, chapter one of the second book, chapter one of the third book, chapter one of the fourth book, fifth and sixth, simultaneously, parallelly, and there are no notes anywhere of what I wrote before. Now, he, let's say he's in the 20th chapter of book one, and he's writing the 20th chapter of book two, and because two other books were started later, maybe it is the 10th chapter of those books. No notes anywhere of what he intended to write or what he's supposed to write, it's all there within him as if one big scene. Oh, I've written this much, now this. Not in words, but in concept. And each chapter begins with a summary of the previous thought and then becomes a whole new dimension and concludes with a summary of the ch chapter structure. And what is fascinating, which we see also across the chapters that he is par writing parallelly, there are certain links. So the life divine first chapter is the human aspiration. And at the same time, the first chapter of the synthesis of yoga, where he's writing this whole movement of the yoga itself and the basis of how nature forms evolution and the, uh, the secret of the Veda, and he's writing the hymns to Agni, aspiration. So there's certain connections across which you see and he's defining terms as he goes along because he has to build a vocabulary for certain kinds of experiences and he defines it here, elaborates it there. So if you read parallelly the way he wrote, it's an amazing experience and that's when you get a glimpse of the largeness of his mind. Such a massive mind, it's not just a giant intellect, it is a mind which is so massive that it can embrace all these different facets of knowledge in one single sweep of vision. It's not possible rationally. It is a state of consciousness above reason. And he write, He even says, uh, it's this whole vocabulary of the higher states of consciousness, what he calls the higher mind, from which the articulation took place, but it was done in a state of total silence of the mind. So he sits at the typewriter and he would say, the mind became silent and the knowledge flowed through. And the mother is observing him, and she describes this. She says, you could see the knowledge streaming through straight into the fingers with the mind completely silent, transparent, and he's typing away. And that, at best, may have a few corrections of the typing, but no need to change the text. Go straight to the press. And that's how he writes 64 pages of six different books at the same time, one every month, 1914 to 1920 seven years, at which point he stops writing. Because it was taking away too much energy from the sadhana that he was doing. <laughs> so you have to understand what he was doing at that time, of course, is beyond our comprehension. But we get glimpses from the record of yoga. What was he doing that required this intensity, that even the writing was distracting from it? And he said, if I had to write more, I could have written, uh, I don't know, he says, if he had to write 70 years, this. Uh, ten times more, it would still not have exhausted a tiny bit of the knowledge that he had received. But he said it was already way beyond what humanity could receive, could understand, and therefore it was okay to stop writing at that point. He did write later, and we will come to that shortly. So 1920, the mother comes back and something very important happens. She describes how they were standing next to each other, and then it was as if from the highest poise of consciousness within her and in him, it was like a zip going down joining, uniting the consciousness. And the two who came as individuals joined into a single consciousness. Now spiritually this is an exceptional event. Because from that point, literally you can say it is one consciousness working through two different bodies. And Mother said in so many words, she said, without him I exist not, without me he is unmanifest. This dual aspect of their poise in the work. 1921 is also around the time when Sri Aurobindo is still leading the yoga of the sadhaks around him. People have come who came from the background of the freedom struggle, many of them, and they became his first disciples. Not all of them were really interested in the yoga, but well, it's Sri Aurobindo, so we do whatever he says. They would go and play football the whole day, come back, sit for meditation, go and play football and gossip and come back and sit for meditation. That's about it. 
And the only condition he said, maintain complete celibacy and keep yourself open to me. That was all. And he would pour the power into them, lift them literally, shape them. I'll read to you the description of one of these disciples, 1920. And he writes like this. Sri Aurobindo was a magnetic dynamo, radiating his light and force to the sadhakas who sat around him, if they were only calm and receptive. Every evening as I sat before him, I felt the force and light coming from him with redoubled vigor and energy. And it was always on the increase. It was as if I was being rewound every evening at the meditation time and given force to last till the next evening, to be reinforced again, then with fresh force and light. The force was illimitable. And I felt that the master was an inexhaustible storehouse of divine force and light. The light that he gave us lightened up the corners of the whole being, and so on. According to the capacity, everyone received the divine blessings from the master. Others also used to have similar experiences. This is 1920-21. But I come to another part which is quite amazing in what he describes. The divine Shakti began to descend with greater force into the head centers and below with an arrangement of molecular structure which began to take place in the brain and the navel region. A kind of electric drilling was taking place in the head and there was felt the breaking of cells and loosening of knots in the whole being. Channels for the flow of light and force were being hewed out and what seemed to be metaphorical phrases when the master wrote about the pouring of light and force were becoming concrete experiences. And as I sat before the master for meditation, the whole being used to become numb as his force began to work in me and fill my nerves with light and force. And so he goes on describing. And then he says at some point he began to have certain experiences which he shared with Sri Aurobindo. And maybe I can just read that. And he says, The master showered on me some of the experiences of the Gita and the Veda. I was seeing visions of the Vedic sacrifice and the truth embodied in the Veda. And then he says, I had intensely prayed to the Divine Master to reveal to me the cosmic form which is described in the Bhagavad Gita, which Arjuna sees Sri Krishna in his cosmic aspect. And he says, and it was granted to me. At the end of this experience, I saw Sri Aurobindo in his effulgence and blazing glory in my vision. And I felt that he was the divine incarnation. When I narrated these experiences, he smiled and said that he had them long ago. <laughs> and he speaks of other experiences and visions and he says, he would see planes, higher worlds. I felt as if possessing a cosmic body with an infinite consciousness and I was full of peace and ananda, bliss. Now remember, this man is doing nothing except to open himself and it is Sri Aurobindo who is infusing these experiences not only into him but into all those who were there according to their capacity. Now this I am sharing with you because it's a very objective example of what he was as a yogi. Not just what he attained in his own consciousness of which we have some glimpse through his writings and through the record of yoga but his power to imprint this into others irrespective of who it is. There's this very interesting incident where a man comes to Sri Aurobindo, this is again in those early years, and says, I want to experience complete silence of mind. Can you give me that experience? And Sri Aurobindo says, sit down there. And he's reading the newspaper. And as he's reading, he infuses that experience, just like that. And after a while, the man suddenly jumps up and says, I'm going bad, I can't think. And he runs away. <laughs> But this is an example of the ease with which he could infuse an experience. I've heard from another disciple, Lady Swarnadi. She was a disciple living in Kolkata. Now this is, I don't know, 2,000 miles away, 1,000 miles away, whatever. And she's writing to Sri Aurobindo. He has accepted her as a disciple. And from the point he accepts her, she begins to have these experiences. She's with a baby who is in a cradle. And so, you know, they put the child in the cradle and they would tie a rope to the cradle and with the slight movement of the wrist they would swing the cradle. So she's swinging the cradle and she drifts into deep meditation spontaneously. She has experiences of her chakras opening and the ascent of the Kundalini. She knows nothing about what these are. She writes to Sri Aurobindo, I saw this, what does it mean? Okay. Now somewhere down the years as these experiences are growing, 
one day she says i go into meditation and shri aurobindo holds me by the hand and pulls me out of the body and makes me fly a great distance now here again is a glimpse of shri aurobindo's capacity remember he is there in pandicherry in his room and he is acting upon his disciples across the world infusing in them experiences but also projects his consciousness out draws them out from the body brings them over and she says i came hovering over what she later recognized to be pandicherry she is taken to a particular building taken inside and she sees a lady sitting there and sri arbindo says bow down before her from this point on she will be in charge of your sadhana so she bows down and that's it many years later she comes to pandicherry she goes to that building and recognizes it as the building where the mother was living sri arbindo literally handed over the sadhana to the mother from that point where she became his conscious shakti and each of the disciples even those who were around him they had a bit of a struggle many of them were freedom fighters remember and here this french woman how do you bow down to somebody who you saw as epitome of colonization right but some of those had a deeper spiritual opening recognized in the mother who she was and it was very important the mother said she too had to take birth in france because it represented the highest um, cultural uh, peak of the western civilization and sri aurobindo and the mother had to bridge these two for the larger work of humanity so some of these disciples had these experiences and as you can see his power was extraordinary but his work was not done what was this work and the full scope of it we will appreciate in the next two sessions but we understand now that uh, the people who came to him went back with these amazing experiences one more i want to share about uh, experience narrated by kapali shastri ar now tv kapali shastri is one of the greatest disciples of sri aurobindo again very humble you don't hear of his name much he has extraordinary writings on the sri aurobindo's interpretation of the veda which sri aurobindo himself corrected and guided and so on he came from a background where he was initiated into the tantra not the tantra as it is taught in the west but as worship of the divine mother from his childhood at the age of 10 he has read the entire mahabharata which is the world's longest poem ever 10 100000 verses he has read the entire mahabharata in sanskrit five times over extraordinary genius he enters into the phase of intense sadhana with ganapati muni who is a great yogi of his own um, of an extraordinary character one of the experiences in his life as he would stay with people who were not so wealthy he would take a coin hold it in his hand as he is narrating stories to the children in the family and at the end of it give back the coin and it had turned into gold just by the infusion of the intensity of the spiritual force he could transmute metal as a way of giving back to the family which was looking after him so this ganapati muni is his teacher and later ganapati muni recognizes raman maharshi names him as raman maharshi and declares him as a great master and the same ganapati muni later comes to sri aurobindo and the mother and he could not meet sri aurobindo because sri aurobindo was in seclusion but he recognized in the mother as his mother spiritually and it was the only person to whom the mother in fact asked him to stay in the ashram because they were looking for somebody who could continue the work after them and they saw in him that potential but that was, did not happen i'm giving this as an example to show you the kinds of people who came to sri aurobindo and the mother each were extraordinary in their own attainment each many of them were gurus in their own right with disciples who recognized in sri aurobindo as their guru so he was literally the guru of gurus for so many and um, this is to say this kapali shastriar who is part of this extraordinary uh, preparation who has attained to self realization before he comes to the ashram and joins sri aurobindo's yoga this kapali shastriar when he first went to meet sri aurobindo he says he had been reading the arya every month when the arya came he would read every day the 64 pages until the next issue came this is the thirst of a spiritual seeker look at our comfort today ah yes i have got sri aurobindo's 20 volumes or 30 volumes sitting in my library one day when i retire i will read them and here's a man who has already attained so much he is reading with that thirst because of what it opens for him and he asked to meet sri aurobindo 
And he says in that first meeting, as he's climbing up the stairs to go to Sri Aurobindo's room, all his chakras begin to open. And he says, such is the power of the master, that even approaching him physically, or your whole inner being begins to open and the chakras begin to open. Of course, he was ready for it, but it happened to that extent at a distance. And such is the intensity of the power and the radiance of Sri Aurobindo's uh, spiritual force. The mother describes how approaching Pondicherry, once it was on train, the other time it was by ship, about 10 nautical miles away, she sees this gigantic descent, downpour of light, and feels his aura at a distance of 10 nautical miles, physically, the physical aura hitting her. That gives you a sense of what he was spiritually as a giant. And all of this is just to give you a, a, an idea of that period. 1926, there is this extraordinary spiritual event. She, the mother had seen Sri Krishna hovering around Sri Aurobindo. And then on 24th November, he descended and identified himself with the physical body of Sri Aurobindo. And when she pointed it out to Sri Aurobindo, he just nodded. Yeah, of course, <laughs> nothing to be said. It was obvious he knew it. And that was the point when formally the Sri Aurobindo ashram was established. Sri Aurobindo used the word ashram, he said, not as a monastic institution, but as the house of the teacher, where the disciples come and live with the teacher to learn to put into practice in daily life the spiritual knowledge. And so it is in this sense that the Sri Aurobindo ashram was established. And at that point, Sri Aurobindo withdrew from active contact with people on a material level, putting the mother forward, put her in charge of the whole sadhana as well as the organization of the ashram. Why? This is extremely important. Spiritually, he, he was there. Of course, working through the mother, he was in constant communication with the disciples through letters for their sadhana, and that's where you have this huge mass of letters. As I said, so little has survived, and even then it consists of nearly four volumes now, I think. And through these letters, we get a glimpse of how he was guiding them, but also sending the force. i give an example there. Uh, there was one doctor, Ramachandar, he was a homeopath, and he's giving medicines to people, sometimes with miraculous effects. There was a case of a Frenchman who was about to die in the French consulate. They call him at the last minute. The priest is already doing the prayers for this man's death. Dr. Ramachandar looks at him, puts the medicine in his mouth and says, in one hour, either he will die or he will be completely cured and walks away. And exactly one hour later, this man gets up completely cured. So obviously this was a shock to all the doctors and the uh, allopaths. And Nirod Bharan writes to Sri Aurobindo that we must discard all of our allopathic knowledge. And Sri Aurobindo says it doesn't work like that. There are many ways through which nature operates. But what we find in the correspondence of Dr. Ramchandar is, he writes to Sri Aurobindo, today I gave such and such medication to this patient and I prayed to you and felt your force at 3.15 p.m. And Sri Aurobindo sometimes makes comments in the margin. And then there's one letter where he writes, I prayed and felt your force as I gave the medicine. And Sri Aurobindo writes in the margin, 2.40 p.m. <laughs> Indicating that he was fully conscious. And as he received the prayer, there was the immediate action infusing the force into the medicine and through the medicine for the miraculous result which you see. And Sri Aurobindo explains this to Nirod Bharan. There is the instrument that is the doctor, the instrumentation, that is the medicine, and then the factor X, which is the spiritual force. And if the factor X is there, of course, you have the miraculous results. But we see this happening all over in the ashram, events after events, which you would call miraculous, but no big deal when it's spiritual. It's kind of expected, of course, because you're in an atmosphere where if it didn't happen, you would say this is something wrong, isn't it? It feels so normal. The people who come to him as disciples, with absolutely no capacity, apparently, but they've come because of a certain opening. And there are examples Sri Aurobindo points to to show the efficacy of the yoga force. One is Romain Palit, he came as a young boy, and suddenly there's this outflowering of poetry, literature, music, instruments, singing, and he is like this multidimensional genius. Overnight, literally, within two years, but that's overnight <laughs> from a capacity point of view. And he had nothing when he came. And Sri Aurobindo points to him as an example and says, you cannot explain that 
as a normal human process unless you understand this is the result of the yoga force pouring into people pumping into them lifting them and another example this man who comes as a tabla player for dilip kumar roy and he has nothing else is uneducated and suddenly flowers out into this extraordinary artist and so on sri aurobindo points to those examples in nirod baran he would write poems which were extraordinary and he says i don't understand what i have written guru please explain to me what i have written <laughs> because there are layers being opened in consciousness sri aurobindo is literally lifting and the mother together are working and doing the sadhana in them now this phase is fascinating in the ashram so sri aurobindo had to withdraw because he had now reached that poise where he was concentrating to bring down what we all know as the supramental consciousness to bring in doubt upon earth and fix it in the material consciousness in the body in matter as an active evolutionary force necessary for the new step in human evolution and in his own consciousness he is able to hold it embody it but he has to fix it into the collective consciousness for which the mother is the link point with humanity and there's this work being done and there's some fascinating things there we won't have time to go in in depth unfortunately so i'll just give a slight indication of this 1927 28 uh, one of the conditions he he said he explained to people was that this overmental consciousness which is just before the super mind which was the krishna consciousness that he embodied that has to come down into matter and this is also the domain of the gods the gods have to collaborate in the physical material action that would pave the way for the supramental consciousness and the mother is preparing for this and you have to see her extraordinary background to fully appreciate she comes as a master in her own right spiritually and with an, a mastery of occultism occult knowledge and all that training which comes with it she was a master in buddhism and the yoga of the bhagavad gita and so on and she becomes the link point so there is a period in which we see what is known as the soup ceremony i believe it was in the evening every day the disciples would be gathered there were a little over 20 maybe 25 they would be gathered there and there was a soup prepared the mother would hold her hands above the soup invoke the force into the soup then pour a bowl herself take a sip and then give that bowl to the disciple to drink with each disciple it was a different deity of the domain of the overmental god world she would embody that deity bridge it and make the soup the link point to infuse it into the person so literally these individual became as if infused with the power of those deities and the experiences began to become quite dramatic quite intense some of them found it difficult to contain but this is showing you not their capacity but the capacity of sri aurobindo and the mother literally bringing down the overmental world and bridging it into a receptive humanity some of them became a little unstable and at one point when this work was almost completed the mother goes to sri aurobindo and shows her the work done obviously sri aurobindo was backing it he was not unaware at which point sri aurobindo says this will lead to what may become one of the greatest religions in the world it will be dramatic it will be um, overwhelming for humanity but this is not what we want we have to learn to let go of the short term benefit for the long term advantage and mother said she went back and in 2 hours she dissolved that whole framework that she had created linking those human beings with the overmental godheads the work of 2 years was dissolved in 2 hours the links broken and dissolved and removed and then she makes a comment with some of them there was still an imprint remaining many years down and she spoke of nolini particularly i think he was linked to varuna and something of that consciousness was still there in him as an influence but uh, this shows you the extraordinary work that they were doing and that's why i said we cannot have a full appreciation of it because it involves levels of consciousness and powers which we can only think in terms of symbols and images we cannot directly experience but we get a glimpse of this and the decision was made because the intermediate domain of the overmental gods taking and linking with human beings and you can see the powers each of them was beginning to manifest extraordinary powers including spiritual powers and occult powers that would have misled humanity to that level and prevented us from looking beyond and so a decision was made to dissolve this 
And so as a result, the mother explains, it takes much longer to build that base for the supramental consciousness to come down. But this is the nature of the work. And I recall one of the persons we had interviewed who was one of these persons in the late 80s. He was already quite aged and he had kind of lost it. The ego had seized. You see, this is where the distortions would, could have happened and would have happened inevitably. He had suddenly lost this power which he was receiving. And he told us in the interview, you know, I was becoming so powerful that I was becoming more powerful than the mother and she became jealous, so she took away my power. <laughs> what a fool. But it shows you, small mind, but the power of the teachers to infuse and lift the vehicle. But when that is withdrawn, you fall back to your small mind. You did not receive, you did not hold, you did not change your nature. Therefore, we see Sri Aurobindo's insistence on laying the first foundation in the awakening of the psychic being. Before the higher ranges of consciousness can be freely and fully and safely accessed. This foundation of the psychic being coming forward then prepares the way by which you do not get lost in these kinds of errors. And so you see in his writings also, in the first writings in the Life Divine and Synthesis of Yoga, he speaks of the, directly of the way to build into these experiences and to these higher states of consciousness. And it's very structured, a very clearly a science that you can put into practice. But then later he introduces the importance of the psychic being and says, get to this first, then your path will be safe. And that was the insistence in the sadhana in the collective. So, 1926 is this transition where the Sri Aurobindo Ashram is formally established. This becomes one of the great events and the passage of, of transition. Um, we see also uh, other experiences of uh, disciples. Uh, Kapali Shastir joins the ashram soon after, the person I mentioned before who came with Ganapati Muni. And he says that where earlier, remember this was a man who was in intense tapasya, intense uh, concentrated practice for decades with Ganapati Muni and then with Raman Maharshi, each giants in their own right spiritually. And he comes to the ashram and he says, I achieved in six months with the help of the mother's force what would have outside taken me ten years of sadhana. And this shows you the nature of the acceleration of the yogic process in the help given by the mother and Sri Aurobindo, but also in the particular process that is distinctive in the integral yoga, of which we will speak in the third session. And this is extremely important for us to understand. Remember, Sri Aurobindo reaches the overmental and the supramental consciousness within five years of his intense sadhana, with no help. He is a pioneer, nobody has done it before. And today he is there to help you, if you could put into practice with the same concentration and intensity that he had, you could reach that in less than five years with his help. Or maybe in five years with being very poor in capacity. Or maybe in ten years or twenty years being extremely poor in capacity. But it's possible for us to do because now with that help, it can be, they can just pour into you the experiences necessary. And it's important we will conclude with that part of what is Sri Aurobindo doing today but if this is what he could do while in the body and irrespective of distance, you can imagine what's possible today when free of the body's limitations and of course always free of limitations of distance. Sri Aurobindo observes that after he retired from the direct interaction with people, he saw more of the world because in that state he was working on circumstances upon the world. And so a little brief glimpse of that, we find for example in a letter to Dilip Kumar Roy, and this man was always tending towards depression and melancholy and Sri Aurobindo had to try to lift him out of it. And there's a story behind because of a past connection of uh, some of these people who were drawn to the ashram were extraordinary beings from human history who had been brought there for the opportunity. And he was one of those very special ones. So he writes to Sri, uh, Sri Aurobindo writes to Dilip Kumar Roy, long before we came in touch physically we have known of you and have been following your progress through your life. Now what does that mean? In Sri Aurobindo's consciousness which is cosmic, he is holding the whole earth and all of humanity embraced. And he is able to identify these people who are known 
from earlier connections or these people who have special aspirations or are trying to make some special effort and with the yoga force being able to push them or guide them or lead them or call them. So he's been following Dilip Kumar Roy's progress. What does that mean? Practically it means he's conscious of all that's happening inside Dilip Kumar Roy but also supporting, guiding and nurturing before Dilip Kumar Roy has even heard the name Sri Aurobindo. And Sri Aurobindo doesn't need to know him by name. He just knows him as, ah yes, this person I know. There's another example the mother refers to. A book was brought to them about um, this French healer called Kue. I don't know if you've heard of it. Do look him up. He was the one who popularized this faith healing where he would, you would repeat a mantra looking at the mirror and say day by day as I watch, my hair is growing more healthy or my body is getting well. Whatever it is, you repeat that and he had miraculous results. And mother says that when we saw that, we recognized him as the person that we had been helping. We didn't know him by name, but we knew him in terms of the work he was doing. So this gives you a glimpse only of how they were acting upon the circumstances of the world. Leading people, guiding people, literally lifting and remember if he's doing this with Dilip Kumar Roy, he's holding the whole of humanity, lifting the whole human consciousness as a collective and leading, pushing, dragging it forward. And there's a letter of Sri Aurobindo saying as much to uh, Nirodhbar and he says, since you've come to me, it is my responsibility to, to grab you by the scruff of your neck and drag you forward whether you like it or not. Of course, you have the choice to leave, but if you're there, then it's my responsibility as his guru to take him forward, isn't it? But remember, they're doing this holding humanity. And what you see in that period is also some of the most amazing progresses in human art, music, literature, uh, philosophy, uh, science, breakthroughs after breakthroughs taking place in that whole period. And people looking forward to some new possibility, some new step in human evolution. And these ideas are abroad all over the world. I believe it was uh, in, in Europe, there was this uh, many books which were written, conceiving of a new humanity to come and so on. But all this is happening at the same time because of this push. And then you see 1950, after Sri Aurobindo leaves his body, suddenly a collapse and almost a kind of a cynicism that settles on the world. And you have to understand how much Sri Aurobindo was responsible for. And you can understand this only when you recognize the nature of the collapse that takes place after 1950. Not a single breakthrough in advanced physics. Yes, technologically we have grown, but in physics, nothing new. Oh yeah, we discovered another particle. What did it change? Nothing. We're still stuck with the steam standard model. We still don't understand the nature of reality and of matter. We're stuck. It's as if nothing has moved forward. And so on with many other things. And then a kind of a crudeness which came in humanity and so on. But we get an idea, a glimpse. This would have been the case if not for Sri Aurobindo literally lifting and dragging humanity forward. Literally changing the direction of human evolution from a self-destructive cycle to an ascent into a new possibility. And the mother's observation in the 1960s, it's as if humanity has split into two groups. One group that chooses willingly to collapse into darkness and another which chooses to rise into the new consciousness. And the split will become more and more evident as time passes and you see this today. A choice that each one of us has to make. But this is to give a glimpse of the nature of their inner work, uh, but I will end with uh, two other, uh, in this glimpse, two other examples of intervention during the Second World War. You see what happened in 1938, and I've heard this from disciples who were present in that period. They said all over in the region of the ashram, there was as if this hope and aspiration and a conviction that something was imminent, a breakthrough was imminent. There was as if in the air itself, a deep sense of delight and bliss, ananda. And people felt it and felt the intensification taking place and it was on the brink of a breakthrough when the Second World War broke out. And Mother comments on this and this is something we have to take as at face value. She says, the Second World War was the attempt of the opposing forces to prevent this realization which was imminent and to deflect the attention of Sri Aurobindo and the Mother to defend humanity's future and this work therefore became delayed. And 
Sri Aurobindo intervened in the Second World War constantly on the battlefield, as some of you already know. Um, he, he himself writes that when initially Hitler was having these very rapid successes, Europe was totally unprepared for the blitzkrieg, the lightning action in which his troops would go and just seize territories. And at some point Sri Aurobindo said, okay, this is it. And he put his force on the side of the Allied uh, forces. And I think this was the Battle of Dunkirk where for the first time there was a reversal. Just that one intervention, poof, and the whole balance of the battle tilts. And then later there is also the example which mother has spoken of that she appeared before Hitler. There was an Asuric being which was guiding him. She appeared in that form of that being and asked him to attack Russia and thus split the energies of the Axis powers which led eventually to the defeat. And that being then appeared to Hitler and said, but don't do that. And he says, no, you are the fake one. That one was the true one. Because she played on Hitler's desire and need for revenge against Russia, provoked that. So these are interventions taking place at a psychological, occult, and even spiritual level in the war, of which we can know nothing, except for two cases. The two examples we know of, and the many others which we don't know of fully, but these two are on record in published form, which I will touch upon as a glimpse of what they were doing in the war. One was this person uh, by the name of Silvio Crassionas. He was, I think, a Romanian general who was uh, captured by the Axis powers. He was put under severe torture. The pain was so great, he would find himself dissociated from the body, screaming in pain. In that state, when he was about to break, he felt a tremendous peace settling on him. He found himself before a person who was like a Hindu yogi next to a Kali temple, and this person began to speak to him. Over 15 days, he was given this deep peace and knowledge revealed, and given the assurance that everything would be fine. During those 15 days, he could hear the screaming of his body under torture while he was in this state of deep peace. At the end of that, he's told that now you will soon be freed and uh, this will be over. And he knows that this being is about to withdraw. So he asks, wait, I know you are there somewhere on earth because he can feel it intuitively. And he says, tell me your name. And as the image fades, he hears the name, he hears the lips moving. And in the book which he has written, which is available today, it's called The Lost Footsteps. We have this whole description across two pages. He writes the name as he understood it, with his own uh, language. O-R-O-B-I-N, space, D-O-G-O-S. Orobin Dogos. He's as if turning it to a Greek form. Urubin do Ghosh becomes Urubin do Ghos. This was active intervention of Sri Aurobindo for one man's support, which could have been critical in the war. It could have turned the whole war if he had spilled the secrets because he knew everything. And this is just one example. There's another person by the name of John Kelly, is it? Who uh, literally saw the form of Sri Aurobindo appearing before him, saying, don't go forward, there's danger there. And step by step, the form leads him through danger, makes him avoid places where there, there's gunfire, there are bombs falling, and he's made to literally told, wait now, wait, wait, wait. And then suddenly the form says, now rush. And he's brought out from danger. He's taken through various stages. Eventually, it's a whole long story, it's published in a book. Uh, the last stage, he says, I've had enough. He's seen the concentration camps. He gives up hope in humanity. He wants to die. So he wears his best clothes, lies down, and says, I want to die. And Sri Aurobindo pulls him out of the body, brings him to this town, which he describes full of bougainvillea uh, flowers and white buildings. He's taken into a room and brought before a woman, beautiful woman, and he writes in his book, he describes it as heaven lady. He bows down to her. He is made to recall his past lives with them. And then sent back. And told that he has still work to do. So the war is over. He is in New York. 
And at some point he comes across this book of the life divine, which Sri Aurobindo's photograph and says, ah yes, that's the person I knew whom he addressed as great sir. And later came and met the mother and recognized her. And what is beautiful is that she too recognized him. This is one example of so many others who were helped. Not everybody saw in images, not everybody had these occult experiences, I would say, but they were carried and lifted. And the numbers of people dying to help them across, even to make them conscious that they have died and pull them out of the misery and the struggle of the soul being thrown out of its body prematurely. All this is a massive work and it took all their energies to intervene, to defend the future of humanity and its survival. My teacher M.P. Pandit notes how the, when he had to take the receipts from the money orders which would come to the mother from, from the ashram, she insisted on signing each one to acknowledge the, the money power itself. While signing, she would suddenly pause and go into deep trance. And then after a few minutes come back and continue signing. And occasionally she would comment, she would say, she said, there was a call from Greece, there was a great danger there, I had to intervene to avert it. We have no way of knowing what they actually did to save humanity. If you have heard the old stories, mythological sometimes we say, where there was a great Asura who ruled the world and there was a divine intervention which was called and so on. Well, this is one of those events, except that intervention is taking place in those subtle, through those subtle domains and so we know very little about it. Hitler himself was convinced. He was convinced that there was a new step in human evolution. It would be the great super race, superman of his own um, Nietzschean concept. And he was convinced that the superman was already upon earth and he sent out people looking for the Superman. They went to Egypt, they went to India, Africa, various sacred places trying to bring back also symbols of sacred powers because there was a whole occult structure there. And there was one uh, submarine that came all the way to Pondicherry. In the middle of the night it surfaced and shone the lights on the Pondicherry town. It was lit up like daytime, they say, those who had, and I've heard this from people. But that was at the end of the war. The war took a different turn. Interestingly, the Japanese surrender took place on Sri Aurobindo's birthday. The freedom of India took place on Sri Aurobindo's birthday. And many critical events in the war took place on Sri Aurobindo's birthday. I've seen this. Uh, Hitler had declared that he would attack England. And before the year is out, he set himself a date, which happened to be 15th August. Why? That's the birthday of Sri Aurobindo. Why? Remember, it's an occult battle. And these dates appear frequently. And on that day in his diary, he notes, the worst day of my life. You see, these, the dates are not so important, they're just symbolic of the fact that there was a huge battle taking place. And Hitler is just one of the puppets of forces who are being fought against. And, there's, and so, as, as I keep saying, we have really no idea and we can only get a glimpse of these things, of the work that they were doing. But none of this was central to their work, which was to bring down that supramental consciousness, embody it and uh, assist in this next step of human evolution. This work, in fact, did take place. It was taken through to the completion which was possible and that consciousness is established on earth in permanence irreversibly. This work was finally completed in 1956 with Sri Aurobindo working from the higher station and the mother on the physical. So there was a point of transition where they had to make a choice. One of them had to take that higher station and the other had to be on earth. And Sri Aurobindo said to the mother that your body is better suited, it's more plastic for the transformation, so I will take that decision. And it's a choice he made. He could have continued. There's a very interesting letter of Sri Aurobindo where he writes, as a result of the sadhana, the body itself has become so conscious, he can literally control all the functions of the body not just physically, but with a spiritual force. So in the record of yoga, for example, there are descriptions where he is walking, and this is way back 1913, he is walking on the bare floor in the hot sun of Pondicherry, which can be like, I don't know, 110 or 120 degrees Fahrenheit, or 40 degrees centigrade. And he's walking on that and he feels no heat and there's only this cool sensation. Because the cellular working of the body has been sufficiently changed 
that even the response to he extremes of heat and cold are completely changed. Even pain is completely changed. It is turned into a movement of ananda. And the cells themselves have been transformed to that degree. There's a comment he makes, even if he were to drink poison, the body could smoothly take it through without affecting anything. And there are many other examples of this kind of the physical siddhi itself. I may again go back to a couple of them because it's worth sharing this. It gives us a glimpse of what he was doing. To bring the body, and this is one of the goals of the integral yoga, in the physical consciousness to liberate it from inertia entirely. Which means it will never experience fatigue, never experience strain of any kind, irrespective of the work done, and not experience the inertia even of gravitation. So, there are, in the record of yoga, he describes how he holds his arm up, eight hours at a time, nine hours, no fatigue. Holds one leg up, holds both legs up, and he's like this, for hours at a time, no fatigue in the muscles. And he's testing the extent to which this transformation in the body has taken place and stabilized. Sometimes there are relapses and he makes the correction. It's fascinating when you look at that. And well, where's the evidence? And I had an interview with somebody uh, with, who was, so the grandson of the maid who was working in Shirbindu's room. Okay, so the maid is working, cleaning the floor, sweeping the floor. Her grandson later became the mother's driver. And we had the fortune of uh, interviewing him. And he said how his grandmother was scared of Sri Aurobindo. Why? And she was uneducated. She didn't know what she was heading for, even working there. She says, oh, he's a great magician. He's a great magician. Why? She explained, while she was sweeping the floor in his room, she looks and she sees he's with his arms and legs in the air and she's wondering what's he doing. Looks scary. And then she looks again and he's vanished. She doesn't see him anymore. And she would get scared. And then she'll look again and he's back. So there, there were things happening with the body which seem miraculous, but they, there's a difference between an occult miracle where there are other beings or spirits or occult energies intervening to momentarily shift the body or make it do things from this work which was a spiritual force entering the cellular working of the body and changing the body's consciousness itself, which is a permanent change, not an occult miraculous intervention. This is the transformation of the body consciousness and the transformation of the cellular working at a physical level, which represents or is a glimpse of the future humanity and the future evolution of the body itself, which will experience the divine bliss and the self at a cellular level. Now, all of this is again to give you a glimpse of things happening of which we can perhaps conceive of in a very indirect way. And so this period is extremely important. Many things are happening. Even uh, there was a point where they were repairing, they were laying the roof of Golkond, which is a new building Mother wanted as an example for humanity to set a new standard of architecture. And they were laying the cement and the rain, the clouds came, heavy clouds about to rain and that would destroy the whole cement laying. So quickly the chief engineer goes to the mother and says, mother, you have to stop the rain. Now this is normal in the ashram, right? Because you're used to all this happening. And she says, I must talk to Sri Aurobindo. The rain gods listen to him more than to me. So she goes and tells Sri Aurobindo. There's another example where uh, there's a storm, intense storm, and mother rushes to close the window. And there's the wind blowing outside, water splashing, but not a drop in his room. Although the door is open, the window is open, not a drop in his room. So he had a special relationship with them. Mother goes to him and says, the rain must not happen until they finish. Sri Aurobindo says, okay. And he continues doing his work. After a while, he asks them, have they finished the work yet? Because there was a lot of pushback from the rain gods. And the person I interviewed, he was the chief engineer, he said the clouds became so heavy you could smell the rain, but it, not a drop came. And finally, when they finished the work, they covered it. Somebody sent the message to the mother. Mother went and told Sri Aurobindo, now the work is finished. Instantly, there was a massive downpour, rain as they had never seen. And mother explained that when you intervene to... In, when you interfere in this way with nature's processes, there's always a kind of a pushback and a compensation that uh, follows. But to this day, this is an arrangement that the mother spoke of. They made an arrangement with the rain gods that it doesn't rain during daytime. Even in the midst of the monsoon, mostly it rains only at night, so that the work of the ashram is not affected. And that arrangement continues to this day. Some of us, we walk to go to the community kitchen to bring food or to eat food. Inevitably, even if it's raining during the day, 
it stops for that one hour, you can go and have your food and come back and then the rain continues again. So we, we're used to that kind of uh, intervention. And we have had so many stories, uh, you could go on for hours with these kinds of stories. But it's just to show you how natural it was for them that everywhere around in that whole community space, the working of a higher consciousness was constant. And anybody who was slightly open and slightly receptive, to the extent you were open, the work is being done in you. Later, because of the Second World War, the refugees came, with them children, and there was a massive dilution in consciousness. The mother had to withdraw this kind of an active pressure because it was too much for the children to bear. And a shift was made that you had to make that initial effort to open, but the help was still there. So that is again an important transition in the history of the work and in the ashram. But because of that, many things got postponed. India's freedom, as you know, 1947, 15th August, Sri Aurobindo's birthday. Why? Because he had initiated the whole freedom movement. Because he had initiated that decisive turn of attaining to the freedom. And it was as if he said, the divine's gift to him. But he said he was not happy with the gift because it came partitioned in two pieces. And he wrote of what was necessary for the reunification of India, and he worked for that equally. When, one last footnote to this. When India was freed from colonization, India became free. Pondicherry was under French rule. Sri Aurobindo wanted Pondicherry to not join the Indian Union. Now this is strange. So many people took it, oh, he hated the British so much. No, it had nothing to do with that. He saw the decline to follow, not only in India, but in the world. And the attempt was to protect this space of Pondicherry and he wanted it to become a university township for which detailed plans were laid out. He himself agreed to become the vice chancellor for the university. An agreement was made with the French government. All the plans had moved forward. At some point, some of the French politicians began to manipulate this to seize it for their own political objectives. And Sri Aurobindo saw that it would be taken out from the original intention, and he withdrew and shut down that whole program. And that was 1949, and then he left his body in 1950. So it was as if the last opportunity given to achieve something in that physical space, and then the mother worked to reintegrate Pondicherry with the Indian Union, and that was also done. But it, you can see here the constantly this effort to create an enclave in which this accelerated evolution could take place and with its impact on all activities human. The ashram itself is not a monastic space. You have spaces for art and music and dance and training and school education with the new educational system and uh, engineering, technology, architecture, um, new kinds of agriculture, everything happening at the same time as conceived for the future. Later she takes this as, as the seed and extends it to the scope of an entire township that becomes Oroville again intended to be a prototype for the future of humanity. So ashram as a focal point with a primary focus on the spiritual evolution, which extends now to Oroville on the scale of a township with this multifaceted change in external activities of life systems to become a basis for impacting the whole of humanity. And bringing humanity together in a representative form is a key part of that because that becomes the spiritual focus for the unification of humanity as well as the transformation of humanity. But the spiritual work is still the foundation. And this we must all recognize. So this, uh, with this I come pretty much to the end of uh, Sri Aurobindo's physical life. We do not say that he died because he did not die. He chose to leave his body. It was a conscious leaving. And we must understand what that means. You see, in your consciousness, when you live across many levels of consciousness, simultaneously. Your being in the body is one of those layers. You separate the body, nothing changes. You're exactly where you were. So he left the body, he didn't die. But then what is he doing? He's still there exactly as he was before. His primary station, the mother said, is in the subtle physical world, in the subtle physical body, which is the domain of the subtle world's closest to the material, from which he is continuing his work and his action. And he gave the mother the assurance that he would not leave until this work was done and he would come back as the first supramental being born in the supramental way. So we have that assurance. We have also his 
I will use this word physical presence because the subtle physical is the physical consciousness in the subtlest grade or the subtle consciousness in its most physical grade. That's why it's called subtle physical. So we have the physical presence of Sri Aurobindo still intact as before with the fullness of his power and capacity and realization working in exactly the same way as before and the mother having left her body working in exactly the same before same way as before with one difference where earlier that focal point was the physical space of the ashram because in the physical body that work now extends much more across the world to all humanity wherever you are if you choose to put yourself in that relationship with them if you choose to become a part of Sri Aurobindo's ashram in your home in your body finally that's your focal point that's your seat of sadhana isn't it all of us today, all of us here, right now, we have the Sri Aurobindo's presence. And as before in the examples I gave, to the extent that you choose to open yourself, he is present and can pour into you all the experiences that you are ready for at that moment. And to the extent that you give yourself. There's a very interesting letter of Sri Aurobindo where a disciple asks him, I was told by a so-and-so person that if I open myself entirely to the mother and surrender completely, then the mother can transform me in an instant. Is it true? I would say instant. Mm. Sri Aurobindo's reply, yes it is true. If you surrender yourself entirely. The problem of course is we cannot because we are not even conscious of ourselves entirely. So we are like the proverbial tip of the iceberg. In the little part that we are conscious, we can open ourselves not even entirely, a little bit, right? <laughs> That's why it takes time. So the key thing is this, to the extent you are able to open yourself, you receive immediately, instantly, the action of the force, of the yoga force. And it works within you to help you grow more in consciousness and to be able to give yourself more completely and so on in a virtuous cycle. With the help of their active intervention, the yoga can be done very rapidly to the extent that we choose to participate in the process. And that's why the first responsibility is ours in the effort that we make to open and give ourselves in a complete surrender. But the bulk of the effort which leads to the transformation is theirs and therefore not dependent on our limitation which makes the yoga that much more easy, that much more natural. There's still the framework of the yoga which we will touch in our third session and many other aspects. But this being at the crux, the essence of it, the point I want to highlight, the help is still exactly as before with the advantage of being present wherever you are. But you must then create the protective space just as in the physical space of the ashram, a protective sphere of influence had to be contained, has to, had to be held, not to allow dilutions to come in. And, and when the dilutions came, it severely set back the work. Well, your first physical space is you. Your extension of your physical space is your immediate, let's say, your room or your house or whichever is your space of sadhana. But you must build, invoke the presence, build and let it grow and build in intensity in yourself and in your immediate environment. And it is only then that this, all the examples we have heard, read, known of, become actively possible to you here, now and wherever you are. But make this commitment. We are at that juncture of human history where an old age has ended and died. An old world has died and a new world is still being born. And the avatar, the incarnation of the divine that is Sri Aurobindo took birth at that point to assist in this transition. And he's still present for this help. So it's an opportunity as never before. You have had no other life in the past when this transition was made consciously. There will be no other life in the future where it will be made in the same way. It's a unique opportunity in this life and we must do all that we can to establish within ourselves as much as possible 
in this lifetime. And for some of us, okay, we will continue into the next. But if you can build the foundation now into the next, it will be easier. You'll have a starting point on which you can grow rapidly. So this is in brief, in summary, the description of Sri Aurobindo's life and work. And as you can see, and I quote him to say, my life is not on the surface for men to see. The bulk of his work is behind the scenes. And yet what he achieved even then in external terms, organizing the whole freedom struggle, building an entire state from <clears throat> practically zero to one of the most prosperous states in the entire country at that point, <clears throat> and then the whole freedom struggle of India. And after that, the extraordinary work of his writings through which he put forward these breakthrough ideas and methods by which humanity could accelerate this evolutionary process, deep philosophical insights, spiritual insights, psychological insights, um, ling insights into linguistics and uh, ancient traditions of the Vedic knowledge and science and the Upanishads and all of these breakthroughs in each of them is what we will explore in our next session which will be this afternoon. But with this you can see what an extraordinary action it is. And the mother's observation about Sri Aurobindo, two observations I'll share. When Kirit Joshi made an uh, exhibition of the spiritual history of the world, I think, or large parts of it in India, he showed how Sri Aurobindo is the culmination of all that. And when he took it to the mother, mother said, no, that's not correct. Sri Aurobindo is not the culmination of the past, he's the beginning of a new future. And Kirit Joshi recast that structure. It's the beginning of a new consciousness. It's not the sum total of the past. That was the base on which work was done. It's the beginning from that base, perhaps you can say, but a leap to something completely new which was not present in the past. And so, the second point, the mother's observation, she says, and I quote exactly, what Sri Aurobindo represents in the world's history is not a new teaching or a revelation. It is a decisive action direct from the Supreme. From the Supreme Consciousness, an action directly decisive. It sets a whole new rhythm, initiates a whole new process, inevitable in its consequence and in its success result, irrespective of appearances, however dark circumstances may be. And Sri Aurobindo said it in so many words. Even if it gets worse than worst, I can still see the inevitability of the supramental consciousness and I will hold my faith and persist and reach to that. And this is the faith we have to hold. If you find the world becoming too crazy, too confusing, too dark, well, disengage from all that because bulk of what you're being told is not true. It's just part of the huge propaganda from every side. The truth is behind it all is a divine working that's taking place. In spite of circumstances, it will succeed. Whether that success is through great pain and distress or rapidly through into a rapid awakening depends on us. To the extent we resist the change, the mother said it will happen through crashing circumstances. And she said, I hope it will not be through one of those dark nights of civilization. I'm quoting exactly. I hope. And then she says in 1972, I cannot promise that the divine will find this humanity worth saving. Why? Because of, well, look at this pettiness. It doesn't mean that humanity will end. It doesn't mean evolution will end. It means that this state of humanity is not worth saving. You need the breakthrough. And those who choose to participate in the breakthrough, well, the help is there. And the transition will be rapid, despite some transitory pains. But we should not focus on that. We should look at the nature of the yoga itself, which is a growth from joy to greater joy. And not painful, not a struggle, not a negation, not an ascetic path. More of this later. So, we can hold this vision of the decisive action direct from the Supreme, that is Sri Aurobindo and the Mother and hold ourselves in gratitude for all that he has done, for all that they have done, and the gift
that is still present, not just they have left behind, they're still here, the gift that is still present to help us grow if we choose to participate in this new evolution. When Sri Aurobindo left his body, the mother wrote this as a prayer addressed to Sri Aurobindo's and the body he has shed, 9th December 1950. To thee who hast been the material envelope of our master, to thee our infinite gratitude. Before thee who hast done so much for us, who has worked, struggled, suffered, hoped, endured so much. Before thee, who hast willed all, attempted all, prepared, achieved all for us. Before thee, we bow down and implore that we may never forget, even for a moment, all we owe to thee. In gratitude to Sri Aurobindo and the Divine Mother. <clears throat> 